Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses that deepen and diversify your existing skill set. Uh, each week, we meet with a professional to discuss their work. And this is made possible by our sponsors, OWC. For more information on how they can assist you in your filmmaking needs, go to owcdigital.com. This week, I'm joined by Mihai Marimari Jr., uh, whose work includes The Master, Jojo Rabbit, and Hate You Give, among many, many other great projects. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to know, how did you get involved with Jojo Rabbit? And, you know, what was that like working on that film? It's, it's interesting because like most of the, the projects, they, they tend to happen really fast. And, and Jojo was uh, one of them. Um, if I remember correctly, I was on the um, reshoots for The Hate You Give mm -hmm. when uh, I received the script from my agent. And um, it was one of those that uh, like everybody knew I was, I was shooting. Um, but they were like, unfortunately, you have four days until you'll have a, a quick Skype interview with Taika. So, I mean, knowing Taika's work, I, I read it right away and I, I, I liked it a lot. And then we did the Skype and uh, I think I had only another four days to, to go back to LA pack and fly to Prague. <laughs> so uh, it, it was one of, one of those that uh, happened really fast, but I'm glad it did because uh, when it happens this fast and you still have your, your eight weeks of prep, it's, it's perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and it looks, it, it looks like you had a lot more time. <laughs> so I'll say it, looks well. it does. I mean, to be fair, I, I, we had enough uh, prep time, which is great. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why uh, when I say I, I was happy, it, it happened fast. It's like if, if they would have taken another week or two to think about, or if I would have done that, that would be pretty much taken out of the, the prep time. So um, I'm, I'm really happy I, I, I got to do it fast. And then I enjoyed the eight weeks of, of prep in, in Prague. What was like when you found out that uh, Taika was going to also be Hitler and like the concept of the film, was there a hesitation at any moment? Were you like, I don't know if we should be doing that? Because I know that initially when it came out, people were like, like they didn't know how to initially take in this experience. And then it sort of became obvious. Uh, that's that's true but on the other hand if you if you watch his other movies like mm -hmm. he's he's part of every single one of them even if it's a small part or or, or a big one now um uh, i remember like very vividly watching boy for the first time mm -hmm. and i was like okay that's actually that's the guy that's that's how he does it you know and and i i think that's the best way to to work with young actors like being part of the of the team and being there with them the whole time not not being just by behind a monitor and like then you need to work more into creating a relationship but if, if you're if you're there the whole time and not behind the camera and just like being part of the acting crew um i think that's how he he does getting he, he gets amazing performances from from these young actors what were your discussions with him like to, to sort of get on the same page and create the look? Um, the, we had a lot of discussions about, about color and, and about, uh, and I remember there was an experience I had as well when like the first time I, I saw color footage from, from World War II. Uh, it, it was a visual shock because we were so used to black and white footage and, mm -hmm. and documentaries like it was so interesting because for some reason in, in my mind was was just this gray world and as soon as you see a color photograph from from that era you realize like no they actually had bright colors in the costumes like they had mm -hmm. bright uh, painted houses and and so on it's so interesting and there was i think one of the main discussions and from there we started developing the whole the whole idea. Um, one other strong visual reference, for for example, was was the, the, I'm I'm really deeply in love with still photography. And if you think about all the all the stills, like if you search for like even if it's Bresson or it's like uh, all the war photos with kids, there's such an amazing juxtaposition there where you see kids playing, and then all of a sudden, it's like wait, wait. What are those? They're, those are like a pile of bombs or, you know, it's like amazingly all of those are black and white, for example, mm -hmm. you know, so it was 
there was kind of uh, not necessarily a strong visual refer reference. It was more a mode reference for, for us, but um, that was kind of the starting point. And there was a lot of discussion about like around color that, that I remember we had with, with all the departments. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, when I started in the film industry, I was working at a post house and they discovered an archive of color film that was shot in during World War II. And so they put together a whole doc on this color film that they found. It yeah. was just fascinating to see. Yeah. Like you said, it, we're so used to it being gray. <laughs> and, yeah. And yeah. Uh, all of a sudden there was life to it. And it's very interesting. Um, what There's two scenes in particular that sort of stand out in that film for me in terms of being sort of burned into my head. Um, and that is the scene where at, at the very start where he throws the, the hand grenade uh, or the little bomb um, and then the other one is when he sees his mother at the end um, so I'm wondering in terms of the first scene you know how did you go about uh, blocking that out and figuring out how to get that that look for that particular scene we, I mean, we, we kind of know, we kind of knew from the, from the beginning, um, I think that's where, where enough prep helps because mm -hmm. we, we storyboarded a bunch of th scenes, but uh, for example, like the one with the, with the hand grenade, it wasn't really uh, fully or, or um, I don't remember if we actually storyboarded at all, but we had enough time to go to the location and because we had mm -hmm. to, to give the art department enough time to, to build all those trenches and, and all mm -hmm. that. And um, taking enough steels and using the steels as like photo boards and, uh, and taking our time like that, that's how you, you come up. It's like, it will be very hard to, to come up with a shot like with that symmetry with all the boys laying on, on the sandbags, you know, and, and things like that. Those, those are things that will require time from the art department. And, it's not just like pointing the camera and uh, uh, I mean, you can discover things by just pointing the camera at something, but um, we, we like by having enough time to prep and, and do photo boards, um, we, it, it, it came very easy for us. The, the other scene, we knew it's a very complicated one and it's a very complicated movie in the movie, you know, mm. moment in the movie. So we, uh, and I don't know if it was like it just happened, but we, we left it towards the end of the schedule and it, we knew we had to build up to that. And the whole idea of, of like one, one other thing that I remember Taika told all of us, like we have to make sure the audience will know uh, who, or like whose shoes are those, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why like we have time to build it up in, in the previous scenes and, and find angles that will show the shoes. So when you actually get to that scene it makes sense without showing anything else I, I but the shoes the other film that sort of sticks with me is master and working on that and what stuck with me is just um the lighting and the framing it, i mean it's a great film but <laughs> like, <laughs> but the lighting and the framing uh it do, what was your you know with pt and uh, paul thomas anderson what was your uh work with that like what did you guys sort of uh did you go to famous photographers or uh other films to sort of get that look and style no uh, it's it's interesting like paul has such a, a different way of, of working and it's less about reference and more and more about um what's visually pleasing and also uh like because and like we did that with jojo too we, we watch dailies with the crew and mm -hmm. that that helps a lot because when you when you watch dailies by yourself in a hotel room or or at home on a, on a laptop it's not the same thing like you need even if it's a small audience you need that and and that does so much for for everything even for like the next mm -hmm. day of shooting and so on but you discover so much and you see it in the best environment and you see it the way the movie will look in the end, and a lot of a lot of that visual aesthetic was dictated by the format we we chose. And like, uh, what was interesting about it was that that we didn't even choose it at the beginning. I mean, we chose to do probably ten percent of of um, of the film in in sixty five mil, yeah. and the idea was that um, because Joaquin's character was working in a portrait studio, 
uh, like he would have probably used a four by five camera, which we we have it in the movie in the end. But we wanted to to go larger format for that. And previously, larger format was used more for for vistas or for for large VFX and and for things like that. But um, we mainly wanted to use it for portraits. And the idea was that ten percent, like when we find an interesting thing, we'll. we'll pull that camera and shoot it and but by watching dailies projected and every time we saw a, a shot from 65 we kind of reversed and a few days after starting principal photography we we decided to go 90 percent with 65 and the only time with 35 so and a lot of a lot of that came from that decision and from from the format itself because it is color saturation and like that that was given by by using a low ISO stock as much as possible. I mean, we were shooting fifty daylight in, inside quite mm -hmm. a lot, um, but also the the format itself. It's like the the perception. Like everything is much more 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 pleasant to, to mm -hmm. the eye. And I think it's a combination of of all that and, and the fall off and everything. When you mentioned they that you know there was a difference between PT and Taika is how do you as a cinematographer i mean you're changing directors all the time every time you you go to a new film so how do you get on the same page with them or like how do you build that relationship uh, with them i mean it, it takes time i think you need to be a very good listener at the beginning and, and try to figure out uh, because everybody has a different style like we we all have a different style you know like cinematographers are different everybody has a different approach and you have to understand what that approach is and you you can only hope you'll find it fast and be the best tool for for yeah. the director um it's it's an interesting process and I, I kind of enjoy it somehow you know it's like trying to figure out what they like and most importantly what they don't like you know now you also worked on the harder they fall so you know and that was shot during covid um so how did you guys tackle shooting? What was that experience like? Well, it was, uh, it was interesting because nobody knew how to approach it. We had kind of an idea and we, we had a lot of guidelines and a lot of meetings mm -hmm. ahead of time and trying to figure out what the best practice would be. We, we had a few ideas. We, we knew that definitely masks will, uh, will make us going and so on. But there are so many things we learned over over time. And you, you know, it's like uh, you have to adapt and try to figure out how to to make it work. Because initially it was like, oh, yeah, we all need face shields and masks. And we were all like, okay, yes. But when you operate a camera, it's like you'll get a lot of reflections. I, I mm -hmm. don't believe in operating looking at a monitor you need your eye to 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 the viewfinder to the eyepiece and and like we're coming up with all sorts of solutions like our our uh b camera steady cam operator dave camidis it was like 3d printed some shields that will clip to the finder so when we're handheld close mm -hmm. to the actors we can use those there are so many so many things that we learned and we had to 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 make to make happen on while we're, we're going you know it's it's stressful at, at, at the beginning but then you get used to it and mm -hmm. uh, because if you think about it, it's like it's there, there's so much extra gear that you have to be careful with and um any anything that um, kind of it's an extra thought that you you have every day you know on top of your your other <laughs> hundred thoughts for for each for each scene it's funny because um I was taking part in Edicon uh, last year during COVID uh, and that was all online, but one of the editors shared a photo because I guess during COVID they got shut down and then she had to fly back to where she was because they were setting up the edit suite there and she showed a photo of herself flying with her RAID server and because we, it was so early, we didn't know what was going on. Everyone was sort of nervous. She was wearing ski goggles mask had rubber gloves on like or yellow rubber gloves and just crazy to to get back but it's like you said it it's constantly evolving and changing yeah yeah um how did you what was your inspiration for shooting like where did you go for inspiration for shooting uh the harder they fall 
one of the one of the main visual references uh, got brought to to all of us by by James at the beginning, and he showed us uh, uh, Kadir Nelson's paintings, and and like again, uh, it's a lot of color saturation, and he mm -hmm. wanted a lot of color saturation, and it was interesting for me coming after Giorgio, thinking about it, like, oh, I just did that, but this is a totally different thing because. Um, just a Western by itself like de demands a, a totally different approach when it comes mm -hmm. to framing, when it comes to, to a lot of a lot of these camera movements and, and so on. And it was uh, it was saturation, it was a lot of color saturation, but it was also somehow different than, than Giorgio. Like if you if you watch Kadir's Kadir Nelson's paintings, you you'll realize right away there is a certain gloss to, to them and, and color mm -hmm. and all that. Um, one other one other thing I usually like to always go to, to a bookstore in the town we're shooting and like even if I know for sure I can buy books online cheaper, I always try to, to buy them in the local bookstore just to keep them going because they're so mm -hmm. amazing. And this paid off uh, right away because I found a book that I, I, I could have not find find it online. I had no idea about it. It's um, the book is called Congo Tales. Um, okay. it, it, it's this amazing photographer, uh, Peter Henkert. And what he did, I think he, he used large format and it's uh, they're a little bit theatrical uh, in a way he, he reenacted um, local uh, tales uh, and and it's it's very interesting there, there's a lot of color saturation again there's a lot of colored light and they they have a mood that we we knew it was right for us right away and uh, mm -hmm. in fact i think I, I did screen grabs from i took photos from from the book and i gave them to to my dit and i told him like this is what we are aiming that and yeah. a few of, of the paintings from from kadir nelson and it's great when you have such a good reference. Sometimes you have references that will, will give you an idea about framing or just, a, you know, then they're like, they're, but those, uh, like these ones that we used were such amazing references because, for example, Kadir Nelson has a painting with, with, with a soldier on a horse. And it's, it's like we've replicated that framing in a different aspect ratio because we're widescreen, but it's, it's so interesting. And, and James brought that up and like, told everybody like this is how Trudy should look on the horse on the train tracks when she stops the train it's it, it's so interesting you talk about the the local bookstores because if you were searching for something online you google it or you go to amazon and it's like here's the answer as opposed yeah. to when i think about bookstores you're in the area and you're looking through them to find what yeah. you're looking for and you're giving you're getting these huge swath of books you never even thought of yeah um, yeah i mean every time i like I, I shot in new york a bunch of times like mm -hmm. uh, every time i go there and make it like uh definitely i want to spend half a day at that strand bookstore yeah. because they have so many amazing things and just going there and like even walking through the aisles like there's something that will jump on you for sure you know yeah what would you say was uh, one of the tougher scenes to shoot in the heart of they fall it's 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 very interesting because nothing was was uh, uh, amazingly tough i mean we we had uh, on top of covid we had a few a few snowstorms but uh, because james has such an amazing approach to to everything and it's it's something that i i feel as well like we have the most um, amazing job in the world so we, there's no reason not to have fun while we're doing it and uh, but what was amazing about James is that he got hit with so many things like COVID and snowstorms and, and like all that and he was like always smiling I was like we'll figure out we'll figure out something it's, it's okay and just like by by just like having that optimism coming from your director like everybody has the same approach and uh, I, I remember for example the train scene was was split in not only two locations but like weeks and weeks and second unit and, and all that like the the exterior was where where uh, up north in Colorado the the train itself the train cars were were uh, in our location where we had uh, Redwood City so 
uh, and we got hit by a, by a snowstorm and then it came in half an hour and then the sun came out. So that was a little difficult and we had a lot, we, we, we needed a lot of help in the end for VFX to add and remove snowflakes <laughs> and <laughs> trying to make it as, as, as seamless as, as possible. But other than that, like nothing, nothing crazy complicated. Those poor, and, poor VFX artists who are just sitting there doing one snowflake and following it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, now, how fun was it to shoot like the little Easter eggs or references throughout the film uh, and the harder they fall? It was great. I mean, one thing was we, we realized right away, I mean, there's no... I, even if there are examples that, that, that are not like they're amazing westerns, they are not widescreen. And, and mm-hmm. um, uh, we knew that, like, no matter what, we have to go widescreen. And uh, we, in my mind, we had to go anamorphic. And there are things, for example, that, like, the, the anamorphic, uh, an anamorphic lens will force you into because of the fall off. And because we, like, I, I love all the anamorphic lenses and the fall-off will kind of force you into framing somebody dead center. Um, but but a, a cowboy hat, a gun belt will, will force you into a certain type of, of approach mm-hmm. and, and, and framing. And uh, it, it, there are things like that. You, we always say we want to do something that was never done. But on the other hand, we all realize, like, I remember James telling us, like, you got to have a, a a train scene you gotta have a, have a, a bank robbery that's like those are things that you need in a you know western now how how do you because color corrections become such an important part of the filmmaking career you know it's no longer just a three light system so how do you work with how do you like to work with colorists to, to get the looks i mean it's uh i i also like uh, and and it's 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 interesting because a lot of times uh, we used to to travel with our gaffer uh, when we're shooting out of time. But like if there is only one person I can bring, that most of the times would be my DIT, and it becomes so important and such an important part of the of the process. And mm-hmm. if you think about it, um, and I'm a firm believer that the dailies should look as close as possible to to the final. Uh, image because if you think about it the director and, and the editor will be stuck with that footage for months and months <laughs> and then they will go into the DR like wait like I, I this was green and like why is it magenta now and so it's like that that's a big danger because uh and if if they don't have the dailies look close to what you want then then it's a you will struggle in the end to to get where where you want and it's nothing worse than like looking at the footage and, and being told like, like, ah, oh, don't worry, it will look better in the end. I was like, yeah. no, how about <laughs> just a little better now? So with, with uh, like working with the same DIT for almost 12 years, uh, it, it, it helps a lot. And it's like um, Eli, Eli Berg is, is my DIT. Like we, we come up with, with all these looks, like he, he was on, on the DIT on Jojo as well. So, when we went to uh, on set for the harder they fall, we realized right away it's like okay, we need to figure out something that has color saturation but has a different approach than than Giorgio. And by showing him all those visual references, he, we we came up with with something that was really interesting because we had a lot more um, blue in the shadows for the harder they mm-hmm. fall, uh, where Giorgio was saturation overall. Um, so the harder they fall had a lot more colder shadows, and what that did. Because there was a, there were a lot of blues in the costumes. Like they, they, we brought those up quite a bit, which is quite amazing. And and um, then in the end, when you have all that, and it was great because James uh, loved the dailies and, and Tom, our editor, too. So when we went up in the DI, um, working with with Team Stepan at Company Three, which was our colors for Jojo as well. Um, basically, the the main difference is um, you have a lot more tools in the DI than you have on set. On set, you can you can work mainly you work with primaries, and you're that's about it. So it's a much um, simpler recipe. When you go into the DI, you have all the palette. You can do power windows. You can do all sorts of transitional grades and, and all that but you can also go deeper into your your primary primary uh, 
corrections. Um, and with 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 team, uh, we like it was great. Like James James said, like I love the dailies, but I want to go even further and push the the whole color saturation idea. So we we replicated a, a three strip process pretty much, and it was. It was very interesting. It was it was really really. Uh, it's not really far off from from what we had on set, but by doing that, we brought back a lot more colors in, in our palette, which was great. So I have one last question that I like to ask everyone I interview. Um, we've been stuck in this pandemic for quite a while, and depending where you are in the world or your country, um, you know, you might be in quarantine, out of quarantine, <laughs> back and forth. Um, <laughs> During that time, it, it, is there a show or a movie you discovered that you think people should check out on the streaming networks? It's it, it's very interesting because like I was so happy to to be home and I mean, I mean for for the first month at least then for then kind of mm-hmm. I, I was started becoming worried but uh, I was just doing uh, home projects like everybody else pretty much because we're usually you're you're away for so long and you have so many things to do at home so when you get home it's like oh I can actually do <laughs> do this so I I don't know what what I what I like usually is like trying to find uh, things that are less known and mm. um, I, I I would go like if I would have um, enough time for for watching movies as well but like luckily i didn't because i did my house project once and then and then james called to tell me we are actually starting the harder they fall <laughs> um but i would i would go to to something like like russian cinema or or things mm-hmm. that are less known and uh, it's very interesting that you think of old movies and you're just like oh yeah they're like old movies they have a different style a different approach but it, it, a lot of times you discover things that are that they they, they they're valid today and they mm-hmm. they stand out and we sometimes go back and try to get inspiration from from there and i mean one director to really look up to would be definitely tarkovsky but Mihalkov would be yeah. really interesting to to look at all right well thank you so much for allowing me to interview you today no, thank you for having me. <laughs> That's our show for this week. Uh, make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com for all our latest courses. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Uh, I want to thank you again for joining us. And of course, I also want to thank our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for listening. <laughs>